Race fans, it's time to buckle in and listen to the fastest hour in racing radio. Your driver is a multi-time NASCAR winner and Hall of Famer, Mark Martin. We cover racing, grassroots, history, we bench race, we talk life, and most importantly, we smash the loud pedal. It's time to turn some laps on the Mark Martin Podcast. Mark Martin Podcast, episode number 48 here on the Accelerated Podcast Network. Mark's guest today is Batesville, Arkansas legend Larry Shaw. Mark and Larry talk about the old days, reminiscing about racing in the late 70s and the 80s on Mark's way up the ladder. Larry's a famed chassis builder, a legend in the sport of dirt late model racing, dirt modifieds, and so many other things. Him and Mark go way back to the beginning, and you're going to hear about it. It's just uh, really, really fun to have Larry Shaw on, on here. Larry and I, uh, go all the way back to uh, before the very first race car. Um, Larry was driving by on his way home from work every night and saw that old uh, 55 Chevrolet getting welded on and stuff and started stopping in and lending a hand. And he was, uh, he was a fixture for a long time. We sort of uh, got our feet wet, wet racing together. And the reason I wanted to have him on you know, the show today is just, there are so many crazy stories that I tell about my career and life, especially in the young years. And when I tell them, when I get done with it, I think to myself, they got to think I'm lying. You know, they can't believe this, you know, and and then I question myself, did that really happen? And whenever I talked to someone was that was there, they said, yeah, it did. So, uh, welcome on board, on board, Larry. I'd I'd love to talk about all kinds of funny stuff in those early years that most uh, most of our fans don't know about, especially all the stories about the 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 tow trucks, which was a major story in those early years. Yeah, I had a lot of experience working with them tow trucks. You know, I'll just take it from the start here. Uh, when we first started racing back in nineteen and. 74 Julian went down and bought a new truck from the Chevrolet place he bought a four-door truck single axle so that was what we actually used the first year of racing in the second year we used the same truck but Julian went and put dual wheels under the back and got the dual bed and put on the back so we have done moved up and need to haul more equipment so that was the second year okay third year when it really really gets interesting uh, Jake Davis which is Bill Davis's dad run the Peterbilt place in Little Rock and Julian talked him into extending this truck and making a ramp truck out of it. So we did that. Okay, what happened now? We had moved up and built a Camaro for Mark to run. It's a 73 Camaro with a big block, which Julian, you know, he was all about big blocks. He wouldn't hardly even ride with if he had a small block. You know, he was just seriously, big blocks all he wanted to mess with. We get the car all loaded on the truck, and now we take off. And we don't have enough motors. So I think maybe he even got another motor, bigger cubic inch. And then we put a turbo on it, headers, all kinds of stuff. So now we've got plenty motor, but now we're running out of gears. And I don't remember what he took that transmission out of we come up with, but what they call a trucker, I know this. I don't really know, but I think it was called a triplex transmission. You had a set of gears. And then when you went through all of them, you reach over here and got another bunch of gears you can go through. We're going somewhere to a race, and I never will forget this. Some kid pulled up the side of us, was excited because we had a race car, and he wanted to race with us. And Julian backed it off to around 75 or 80, kind of let him catch his wind, and he gets caught back up. I never will forget his front wheel was just kind of wobbling on that uh, Camaro that he was trying to race us with. And Julian runs him up to about 100, 105, and then waves at him, shifted around, putting another hole, and we're gone, you know. That was a true deal. But then, uh, we, we had plenty motor and plenty gear, but now we can't get the thing to stop quick enough. So Julian tells Troy Lynn Jeffrey, which worked for Julian trucking place, he said, you got to get some brakes from this thing. We're going to get everyone that's killed. So Troy Lynn, you know, he tried different things, but the last thing he did, you know, anybody knows the thing about trucks and stuff, they got a brake booster on them. So Troy Lynn felt like if one booster was good, two would have to be better. So he put two brake boosters on here. So it's Saturday afternoon, about 2.30 in the afternoon in Baseville, Arkansas, and everything is rained out. He called Don Hester in Tupelo, Mississippi. One of those things running down there. He said, yeah, they're running at Columbus, Mississippi, but they started at 8 o'clock. 
which is 2.30 here, and it's about a six-half or seven-hour drive there for normal people. But we had Julian driving, so we're in a little better shape. So we take off down through Mississippi, and we're going down the long, straight hill. And I'm, we're all the time watching for Cobb, the state trooper. And I told Julian, I said, Julian, there's a state trooper. So he showered down them brakes. That's the first time we had to use them brakes. And what happened? Them booster just locked them front brakes up and burnt the brake pads completely off. I looked behind us. It looked like a double-A fuel dragster took off. So he gets, <laughs> he gets it geared down. He shoots into a shelter run service station. Tell Mark to get out and put some gas in it. And told me to run next door to that Napa store and get some brake pads. So we get on to the racetrack, and we unload the Camaro. And the uh, best I remember is the old Columbus, Mississippi racetrack. And on the infield of the racetrack, they had a football field for the kids to play in during school, I guess. I know it, the track was real slick and slimy. So when Mark Hot left, he went between them goalposts, come out on the back straightaway, and that was in hot laps. And we went ahead. I don't remember what we did in the feature, heat, or nothing, because – I'm back over there working on this truck trying to get brakes on it. Now, that's one of the stories that went on there. Is that bad way you've seen it, Mark? Well, yeah, that is that. all of that stuff did transpire. And that is the same truck uh, that we used the next year uh, on asphalt in 77. Um, and, that, and, and, and we added a little homemade, like, U-Haul trailer to, to tow behind it and, and on that ramp truck. And we were going to uh, Fort Smith, and we were leaving the trucking company late, as always. Dad was mad. We were on a curvy two-lane road up going toward Heber Springs on our way to Fort Smith. He caught a, oh, I don't know, I guess it's a Volkswagen or something. Caught him on a curve and wasn't going to slow down, so he's going to pass him on a curve. Well, when we pulled out to pass him in the curve, here come a dump truck. So he has to ditch it. And that uh, and that trailer breaks off, the tongue breaks off, and uh, just goes end over end. And I remember it was very scary. We went through a ditch and scared the fool out of all of us. And you said, as soon as the truck stopped moving, you said, "Boy, I bet that trailer went for a ride back there." And Claude Reed said, "said No, it ain't back there." And uh, we got out of the truck. Oh, I was mad. I could have killed my dad. Because we were going for a 250-lap race there at Fort Smith, like the Arkansas State Championship or something. Trickle and all, you know, all the guys from Wisconsin were going to be there and everything. And now my dad's done messed us all up. As you remember, we had a spare motor in that, a 55-gallon drum of, of racing fuel, all the tools. That thing just exploded. There was a bare engine laying in the woods and... You know, you'd see a nine sixteenths wrench here and a quarter inch wrench there, just scattered all through the woods. You remember that? Yeah. And you know, there what we Julian, his nickname was Cat. And I always thought it's because he wore starch jeans, starch shirt, and real neat boots and everything it was always real clean and neat. But I found out later he had nine lives, but we almost we almost used two of them right there that day because that ditch that he hit, we cleared that thing, but if it if the bumper would have went down that thing, that car would have sheared the cab off the truck and everything probably. So that was one of the bad times. That we, it was uh, at Fort Smith. It was in August, hottest time of the world in Arkansas. And Mark won the race. It was uh, some show. You are listening to the Mark Martin Podcast on the Accelerated Podcast Network. Mark Martin Podcast, episode number 48. Larry Shaw joining us, Mark and Larry, retelling war stories from the travels up and down the road in the late 70s. More with Larry Shaw. Before we went to Fort Smith, we had built a new car to go run the World Series of Asphalt in Florida for 19 and 77, I believe it. Yeah, it's been 77. Got a new car frame off of Ed Howe and... We brought it down here and we finished it all up, and we was all excited and everything. With Julian, was more about the dirt race in a long time. You know, he made everything heavy duty. Everything had to be beefed up and everything. We take the car back up to Ed Howe, and Ed wouldn't even hardly look at it. He said, this thing is too heavy. Y'all got too much weight here. So we had to bring it back home, and we cut bolts and nuts off for three or four days. I think we ended up getting three or four pounds off, and then he found out about a place we could get some aluminum heads over at Mena, Arkansas. J.B. Brotherton, Brodex, had just 
started them to building aluminum heads. And Julian found out about it. He called over there and asked that guy if he had to set aluminum head for a small block. He said, uh, yeah, but they go to Michigan. I believe he said this for Bob Senator. But Julian talked to him and letting him have them. And this is Sunday afternoon when we're talking about this. And he, it's a winter time, snow on the ground. And Mena, Arkansas is in the hills. You can't hardly get in there driving. And you sure can't get in there very easy in the airplane. He told JB, he said, can you, uh, we like to come and get them heads. He said, you can't get over here. These roads are all messed up. He said, we're coming in there. JB tells that story later. He said, yeah, I was in the kitchen talking to my wife. And she said, what do you do? He said, well, I got somebody from Base Arkansas coming there for some heads. They can't get here. She, she said, they're coming up the plane. So JB tells, he said, he goes to the airport. Here comes that plane there, almost dark. Jumped out, grabbed them heads, come back to Basel. And we put them on there. And then uh, what happened next was we got ready to go to Florida to the World Series of Asphalt at New Smyrna Beach. We was going down through Alabama, and we run up on we run up in this real. We didn't know what happened. We couldn't see over the hill. But there's cars and trucks just everywhere. And Julian said, Shaw, get out and go up there and see what's happening up there. So I run up there. And I'm asking some guy standing there. I said, what's happening down there? He said, they're making a Burt Reynolds movie. He says, Hooper. They're getting, said they're getting ready to shoot a rocket car across that river down there. Well, what happened was the state of Alabama had gave the old bridge to Hollywood to make this film. But what happened, they, they had done tried to get this thing crossed for a more time. They never could get everything just right. But they finally got it crossed. And I've seen it go across there and everything. We get down and Barry, they stopped us, this state trooper stand right here beside my door. And I'm looking over at this piece of metal. I mean, this is a long time ago. And I asked that state trooper, I said, was he hurt? He said, no, it's a dummy. I said, yeah, I know it, but was he hurt? But <laughs> that's what we knew a whole lot about that remote control stuff, you know. But they went on to Florida. We get down there. I don't remember. We won real good right at first, but we got better. That's the third night. We got a lot better. Then we crashed. Bits of stuff down, up, and back. And we, Ed Howell was down there race. So we go over and had Ed come over and look at the car, see what he thought. You just need to take this back home, strip it, bring it back to Michigan. I'll either put a stub on it or we will uh, get you another frame race. Well, that wasn't what Julian and Mark want to hear. So somebody there had a shot. So we went and to their shot and we worked. We missed two nights, I think. Third night, we come back out. And I think Mark either qualified third and run fourth or vice versa, but that's what we did. Ed Howell come over and looked at all over. He said, Maybe y'all still need to bring out to Michigan when you get back home. That's kind of, that's kind of where our asphalt world started. Yeah, yeah. And so that was uh, that was the hauler story for, uh, what was that, one, two, three, the fourth year. Um, and then the fifth year, um, and you weren't here for the whole thing. I think you stayed, you had been working full time for about a year and a half in, the, in May of, of, of 78. And uh, we were chasing the ASA points championship already uh, that year. Well, anyway, I want to talk about the haulers because I'm not sure you were there through all the experience, but I had this bright idea, and I don't know why Dad let me do it, but I had this bright idea of building a Ford Cube van and uh, getting, getting a 460 in it. And I don't know why I thought that was a good idea, but I did. At the same time, Dad commissioned them guys down in Little Rock to build the world's heaviest trailer on earth to pull. And a long story short, of, you know that there's no cell phones in 1978. And uh, we blew up more motors in that tow truck than we did the race car that year. We blew three motors up, all of which we were in the middle of nowhere and had to walk forever to go to somebody's house and knock on their door you know, to call for help. But uh, that was the hauler for for the the fifth race season. That was the one you took to Dillon when you went to Michigan, right? No, when I got ready to to, to go to Dillon's after, after that 78 season and that Ford was a disaster, I went down to Stanley Woods and ordered a new cube van with a, a Chevrolet cube van with a uh, 454 in it. And that, that thing... Uh, propelled me through 79, 80, and 81, uh, even through my first uh, five cup races and my five Xfinity races and my ARCA race and all that stuff. We used it for all that, pulling an open trailer. That was an awesome truck. You are listening to the Mark Martin Podcast on the Accelerated Podcast Network. 
Mark Martin Podcast, episode number 48. More of Mark's conversation with longtime friend and Batesville legend, Mr. Larry Shaw. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, we see a lot of excitement on the racetrack right now in NASCAR. Uh, awful lot of disagreements and uh, people, you know, mad and stuff. And let's talk a little bit about, uh, uh, my, you know, our first uh, two years were really, really rough. Uh, we seem to have a lot of jealousy and uh, a lot of competitors that seem to not like what we were doing. Tell a little bit about Jimmy Lee Grubbs and and uh, and some of the run-ins that we had with with them and the Pouchers and some of those guys. You know what was really irritating them was you know you had this young kid, 14 years old, coming in here and. And Mark was just so talented right off just because he wasn't scared of that. He'd been riding the motocross, um, not not competition, but on the street. And he had a cut down Volkswagen. He, I mean, he was pretty gutty, but he also had a real good feel for the car. And it just, you know, we're running against people, as Mark would say, at them green tooth pupwood haulers, you know. I mean, that that was a lot of people we'd run against. And a lot of them just was anywhere from 25 to 40 years old. And, you know, some of them had won some races and been done pretty good. And, Mark started out here, and we won quite a few, and Jimmy Grubbs was one that gave us a hard time. And the Poucher, they was nice people, too. They had the same thing we wanted. They just wanted to win. One place we was, I think it was at Stuttgart, Arkansas. Or I believe that's where we was at. Where, that, uh, that's it, yep. They didn't really have a car rule back then, but some were another. Tommy Joe had come up with a right rear tar. All we had up there was about a 10 or 11-inch tar, but... He come up with like an 18-inch wide tar for the right rear. And man, he was killing us off the turn, you know, just eating us up in that in that uh, heat race. They just had one of them. But anyway, he uh, come off the racetrack and hung the, the guardrail and tore that thing off and tore the port panel and everything up, but did away with the tar. And I just kind of raised my hand up like I thought it was something, you know. But then old man Parker, he come over and, thought I thought that was funny. I said, yeah, well, it's kind of funny. He put around and strung a lick at me. And first thing I know, I think there's 27 people in that fight and we got sorted out there that night. <laughs> but, but, but we won the feature because he didn't have another spare tire, you know. So we went to I-30 the first time that we ever went to I-30, which is at Benton, Arkansas. Mark had been winning up here at Cheaper Springs and Independent County Speedway at the time pretty, pretty good. But I think during my whole five or six years with Mark and Julian, I missed two times and Julian missed two times. And the first night we went to Little Rock was a night that Julian didn't go. And we get down there and they're not going to let us in because Mark's not old enough. And then they called for the track promoter to come over, which was Kenneth Clifton. He says, is this that young kid from up at base we've been running? And I said, yes, sir. He said, if you'll sign a release for him, I'll let him in. I said, okay, and I told Marcus, where if you do, don't get out there and get hurt, because I'm on your list now. And that's kind of where we started down there. Yeah, and uh, I don't remember who it was. One one of the guys down there, we we won, started winning some races down there, and one of the guys got uh, pissed off and and quit racing because they didn't. He couldn't. He he said he wasn't gonna race if a kid was gonna beat him. Do you remember who that was? I think it was that Ryder 66 truck or car. I guess I remember that's who it was. But we had, they, they had something that we didn't even know about that quit, you know. So what, but, what about what about the night Jimmy Lee Grubbs uh, took a stab at me and missed? And uh, and so then he just waited for me to come around. I saw him. I saw him up there waiting on me. So I knew, you know, I knew. he. So when I caught him, I just. I just put him up the telephone pole. I didn't even try to pass him. I just hooked him and sent him. And uh, I was carrying the checkered flag around, you know, after the race. And I looked over in the pits, and there was there was a hell of a fight going on in the pits. And so I just took my time getting back over there. My uncle Rick Milligan came running out of the stands, and by the time Jimmy got got to the pits, uh, my uncle was ready to punch him in the nose and. I think he probably got him before he ever even got out of the car. So I think Harvey Shaw had done showed up on the scene too. He had that car he called had a oh I don't remember what seven eleven or something on it. You know I think he got in that fight too. Yeah. 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 Oh man. Yeah, and, and then you know it was just a lot of crazy stories, especially especially those first four years. It seems like. Uh, 
you know, all, all through there. Um, they used to protest, you know, that first year we raced and we'd win a race and they'd protest the car and y'all would have to take it to a gas station somewhere in Batesville and tear it all down, tear the motor down, tear the rear end apart. It was always legal, but boy, they, they made you guys work all night on Friday night so that, you know, to tear it down and then put it back together so we could race again on Saturday night. Yeah, that was our biggest deal for tearing us down because they didn't think we'd get it back together in time to get to the next racetrack. But we uh, we was able to do that back then. But, and then, you know, I was glad to get out of them first two years because after we moved up to late models, we, I mean, with ASA, we still had to check the motors after the race. But on dirt, we didn't have that problem tearing them down all the time. You know, if you're legal to start, you're legal to win, you know. Yeah, them, them days there, man, I tell you what, I, I don't know if I'd even want to go back and do that over again. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. They were really, really rough. That's, like you say, especially the first two years, because, you know, we were in uh, in a limited division where there were a lot of rules, you know, and, and, and there was an awful lot of jealousy. It was really, really, we had some, some people that were really hating racing against us and made, made life difficult on us. But, the third year when we moved into the late model dirt, you know, I don't know. I don't recall there being any engine rules. You know, you can run uh, them, them big carburetors you want, as big a motors you want. Dad built, uh, he had Lenati build a 496 cubic inch big block to go in that car. And remember w- w- the first, that car weighed 3,060 some pounds when we finished it. And it was almost all on the front wheels. And I could not steer that car fast enough on dirt. I just couldn't, I couldn't keep up with it. I just couldn't keep the front wheels where we, and we took it up to, we took it up to, um, uh, West Plains and they did, yeah, that front straightaway didn't have a wall. It just had a dirt bank. And I, 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 I run up that dirt bank about three times that night while we were up there. Yeah. And you know, when we got that motor in that car, you know, here you are about 115 pounds and we got this, all this truth is known. We probably had 55% front and 45 rear, which should have been right the other way around. And Mark could not turn this thing, like he said. So we was almost the point we had to do something. So Julian come up with the idea of putting power steering on, which nobody had ever heard of that at the time. So right. we went to South Park, got some different pumps and different pulleys and after we went through a session of throwing belts off, we finally got that figured out, and we were pretty good with it then. You know, Mark could steer it pretty good then, but the motor actually stuck out of the hood, and we had to raise Mark up so he could see over the hood scoop. Now, around here, I mean, he pretty well won everything at Independent County and the big half-mile track up at Drasco, Arkansas. At the end of the year, we decided we are going to go up in Kentucky at Hopkinville and Paducah, and there's a three-day deal up there. We thought we had a lot of cubic inch until we got up there. Whoa, they had a lot of cubic inch up there. Yeah, they had the 540s up there. Yeah, that's what they had, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was great. But that was so miserable, getting that power steering geared up, because we were far from engineers, you know, and, and there was a lot of uh, midnight oil burnt getting that getting that steering on there but once we got the steering done we could haul we we started hauling the problem was we had it had three link suspension and we had uh cheap heim joints on the panard bar and about every time we get ready to win a race the dang panard bar heim joint would break and that happened a half a dozen times before either you or dad figured out they made a aircraft grade heim joint and once we got the heim joints on on that panard bar we uh we finally got where we could close the deal and started winning us some races yeah and you know another time we, i don't don't remember if it was nashville or where we was at that's when we had a you was running real good in a race a boat went flying through your grill and right through the radiator and that's when Car- Kel yarbrough come over and we didn't even know anything about stainless steel screen war until then that's something we learned a whole lot we learned a whole lot from our mistakes that we didn't know <laughs> yeah that's how that's how you learned everything back then was trial and error uh there yeah, wasn't no such a such a thing as the internet or anybody to teach you anything you had to go out there and try it and see if it worked or not 
in the base of Arkansas, if it wasn't for a chicken truck, you really didn't have no parts. <laughs> From travel to NASCAR to Gucci Mane, we cover it all on the Mark Martin Podcast. Mark Martin Podcast, episode 48 here on the Accelerated Podcast Network. More with Batesville, Arkansas's Larry Shaw. Another funny story, when we went to uh, Rockford, Illinois, to the National Short Track Championship, I don't know who got Julian on this deal that we should run an automatic transmission. Told us how, many, how much faster it'd be and everything. So to put this automatic transmission in Mark's car was a huge deal. Headlines, everything. And we get up there, and Mark goes out practice, and he don't like this thing at all. And Julian won't let us take it out. He said, well, you're going to have to qualify it. So anyway, I don't know where Mark qualified, but we pulled the transmission out before the, the, the 300 lappers the next day. And then Mark won a national short track championship that year. But well, we had a hassle. Julian would come up with them ideals, and we'd go ahead and pursue them for a little while. And then we end up kind of going back to what we had before, you know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that automatic transmission, yeah. We, the problem was, you know, they had a practice day. Um, and we showed up for practice going to test that thing out. Well, when you let off, it just freewheel into the corner. Wouldn't even slow the car down. You couldn't drive it like that. So, you know, after practice is over, y'all had to spend the whole rest of the night changing, uh, changing a trans, you know, putting a clutch back in it and the transmission, all that stuff, putting fly- flywheel clutch. For- that was a big deal. You know, the next day we rolled out there and, and timed in second, trickle set past time. We timed in second. It was, uh, that was amazing, amazing weekend. Something that we never dreamed we would be that competitive. At least I didn't. Now you and no. dad were pretty big, uh, shit talkers. So, you know, y'all, y'all might have thought we could do that, but I certainly didn't think we could. Well, before we, before we left the house that morning, I told her, I said, we ain't got no business going up there at Rockford. And she said, oh, y'all be okay. You'll be fine. She always had more faith than I did, seemed like. We get up there, and I remember when we won the race, I, I looked at the – you know, we went up there the year before, and it scared us to death just watching them, you know, that's so fast. Anyway, when they hung out, uh, I looked at the pictures before the year we won it, when they put those uh, – that horseshoe of roses around Dick Treckle, who ever won it, it went just a little bit past his knees. I think when they put it over you, it went almost to the ground, you know, just a little short guy. But yeah. Yeah, that was that was a that was a tough Sunday afternoon there. Yeah, boy. That was uh the you know, I tell people the biggest uh biggest wins of my career were um, you know, that the uh, Arkansas State Championship and seventy four at Benton, the Bolivar win, which was absolutely unbelievable in seventy six at Bolivar, Missouri. And then the National Short Track Championship in 77. Uh, honestly, there, there are no wins in my career that were as big a deal as that was to me. That deal the Arkansas State Championship, back then, we, if we won, if you won or run second in, in the Benton Speedway back then, you all, you, the top two cars always had to go dead last. And they had 20 to 24 cars every night every night she's down there, you know, so to win them thing from the back, and that's what we did when we won the Arkansas State Championship. But to the Bolivar deal, when you go up there, you had Ken Esri, Larry Phillips, Crane, you had all the Gary Go- Goldberg, all the good drivers was there. And you remember what we had to do to get in that? Yeah. We, uh, we, uh, we run second. They say we had to come out of the C, out of the C to the back of the B, and we got to second in the B. And if the guy that won it didn't want it, he, you pay him start money and you get his place. So that's what we did. We took, we run second in the B and we started the back and, and won that deal. And that, that was unreal. Yeah. You know, and I didn't even know I took the lead. I mean, we started in the back and I was, uh, I'd never run on dry slip racetrack. So I didn't know. So Ed, I was searching for moisture. I was running right down, damn near in the infield. And uh, just passing cars right and left, just passing, 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 passing. Hell, I never had no idea I even took the lead and won the race. It was a, it was a pretty crazy, uh, you know, it was really a crazy night for, um, and just such a big win. I mean, I remember the fans just climbing the fence, just going crazy on the front grandstand. You know, they were just climbing. A f- I mean, it was just like, you know, 
and you know, I was, I mean, I was 17, but I looked 12, you know, and it was a, it was just a, it, it was quite a night. Yeah. And you know, when we started running, after we got back from New Smyrna beach uh, that year, when we started running that, but what we did, we'd run Springfield on Friday night and leave there and go all the way to Fort Smith and run Saturday night. But Max Speech, which he was a promoter at Fairground Speedway in Springfield, Missouri, he'd always run three shows in the spring. So we'd run Springfield on Friday night, go to Fort Smith, and come back to Springfield and run Sunday afternoon, Sunday night. We did that three three weeks in a row, you know. Now, that really put some work on us. Back then, we had Fort Smith and Springfield Fairground. Now, that was tough racing because you had, you had, of course, Larry Phillips. And then you had Rusty Wallace and then all the local people there. It was good. They all went to the same track we went to. So, you know, when you want to race against that bunch, it was really something, you know. Well, it was. We were racing against national heroes. And, you know, we I, I sure didn't have any idea that. I mean, a lot of times we would go to a big race like that just to try to learn something, you know, learn from the uh, the legends. Yeah, yeah. You know, people and we didn't it. know Larry. We did not know anything. I mean, no, we we're just, to... we were dumb, dumb, dumb. We knew nothing. I don't know how we ran so good. No, I don't either. And you know what was funny? You know, <laughs> I never will forget you telling this. You tell this story over and over. You know, we decided at the end of the year, uh, at the end of uh, 76, when we were still running dirt, we took our dirt car to Springfield to run against Bobby Allison, Donnie Allison, all the people up there. And we had our dirt car, and we had great old big fender wells where we've been running big old humper tires. And Donnie Allison come by and want to know if we've been running that a or something, didn't he? Oh, yeah, Donnie still. I just talked to Donnie at Darlington just the other day. Every time I see him, he says, remember that time in Springfield you had that old dirt car with them big old <laughs> fender wells? And, and I said, yeah. He says, you remember what you told me? And I said, no. He says, you told me I'm going to run NASCAR one day. And he said, yeah. and he said, I told you that that was the attitude. Yeah, Julie, we used to be up there working at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning on the race car. And, of course, Julie, and he smoked them old two for a quarter cigars, you know, up there at 2 o'clock in the morning. And he'd kick back and take a break. He said, Shaw, that bunch over in Charlotte, North Carolina, they don't know who's coming. They know somebody's coming there. So we're just like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. So who knows that would have happened, though? <laughs> no, I just thought that was big talk. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, he walked around them white pants on that orange shop down his pocket. He strutted around pretty good, especially after one. Now, he really got a little cocky then, but I love Yeah, him. Yeah, and you would chime right in. You were pretty proud yourself. The Mark Martin Podcast is a production of the Accelerated Podcast Network. Mark Martin Podcast here on the Accelerated Podcast Network. More of Mark and Larry Shaw as this episode continues. Now, remember that time when we were getting ready to go out to Las Vegas and that reporter got a hold of you but thought it was me. And yeah, you I told him, him didn't you tell him that we could outrun Larry Phillips on four flat tires or something? He said I said that. That sounds like something I might have said, but he put it in there <laughs> like that. I could, have crawled, I could have crawled under the holder when we got out there. Me so too. That's one, that, that one of the times that we didn't show very good. I know it. I know it. We didn't run very good. I think I, I, I think we ran eighth or something like that. It wasn't very impressive. But, you know, the reason, one of the reasons we didn't run real, two reasons. First of all, it was flat as a pancake quarter mile, and that was not my wheelhouse, number one. Number two, I think we run the hardest Goodyear tire known to man because it was like, I don't know, 250 laps. It was a long race. And, you know, we thought we would, you know, not wear out tires and dang sure couldn't stop and change tires. And so I don't, don't think we did ourselves any favors on, on tires for that race. No, and that's the same deal. That, that's the same day that Bill Davis and the, the gentleman from Memphis that sold Thurman King, we all went out there in the same. We took a van and Julian's hauler. That's where we blew out about eight tires getting out there. And we found out. When we got out there, we found out what was happening. The bow stem was laying on the drum on the rear wheel, burning the bow stem too. We blew out all those tires. We spent more time changing tires going out there, and we did drive it. 
Yeah, and I remember, you know, I was I was pretty young. I'm still like 17 or something. Uh, we did. I think we stayed at a, a casino, and I wasn't impressed with y'all because y'all was, y'all was all going out when we weren't at the racetrack. Y'all were going out gambling and kind of. Uh, I was kind of left out of left out of things. So uh, I do vaguely remember y'all doing a little gambling or something, having a little we, fun. We stayed at we stayed at Caesar Palace. You remember that morning we left? Julian had, Julian had done figure out how to uh, what was what was that game he was playing? Some game he oh I don't know what was playing crap. He done figure out he could go in and put so much on the seven, so much on eleven. Do that. He said we're gonna hit that before we leave town. <laughs> but he went through that. We, we didn't we didn't win that, so he come back home. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, I don't know. That's a that's a lot of memories in in one short period of time, man. It's hard to imagine that out of Batesville, Arkansas, you know, and the little dirt track right outside of town, I was able to make it from there all the way to the NASCAR Hall of Fame. And you, Larry, were able to uh, make it from there to winning every major dirt track race that was worth winning in the whole nation as a as a car builder. Um, it's just, it's it's mind boggling to think what we were able to accomplish when we started not knowing a, a darn thing. Yeah, Jim would be proud of us. You know, I built 5,463 race cars during that time, and the car number 35 is one that really kicked my dirt world off. Uh, I'll tell you just a little bit about that. I built it for Don Jeter in Woodrow, Oklahoma. He flew in over here and wanted to know if I'd have time to build him a dirt car. He had a gentleman named Buck Chadwell going to go run it. So he lands out here in his King Air. And he wanted to know what motor we need. And I just come back from Baker Engineering a year before. And I said, well, we need to get a 430 Baker. So we take off to Michigan and we get up there. And Don asked me to show what motor we need. So we need one just like that right there. He said, oh, no, you can't have that. I said, that's going to Florida or Georgia. So I can't sell that. Well, he said, I'll ship it to you next week. And he said, oh, we'll take it with today. He said, I thought y'all flew it up here. We did. We can get it home. He said, when y'all going to race? He said, a week from Friday. Well, see. That's the first I heard that. I mean, here I got 13 days, and we had been building asphalt cars up to this point. I'm going to build a dirt car and do all this. So at that time, I was using Ed Howard for a stub, so I called a friend and asked her, but 4.30 in the afternoon, I done asked the pilot if we were going to go up there and get one of them new stubs before we need to land. He told me it's Saginaw. So I called her. He said, Sean, it's 4.30. Where you at? I said, down here, Grand Rapids. She said, no, I'm leaving here at 5.30. I said, can you take that to the airport? So y'all got a plane you're gonna get that home he had a king air so we come back down here and landed we started work on that uh tuesday morning and uh we got the thing all done and went to uh Hutchison, kansas friday night set quick time like 1.6 seconds quicker than anybody else won the heat race won the dash the next day we lined up and we lapped up i, ha- I had one car there van gimble we lapped up to him he runs second to us and we left the racetrack that day. We had sold seven race cars. And I'm coming home. I told sure I said, we're out of the payment business for a little bit because I said I sold seven race cars out here. And one of them was to Moyer. Wow. Billy Moyer. Yeah. And that was and 1980. I'd been in business one year, and this was 35th car I built. Wow. Yeah. Always a lot of fun to get together and talk about old times and you were right there for all the all the good stuff in the beginning and uh it is just uh it, it's just a delight to be able to share it uh share stories with you well you're special to me okay and thank you for everything and thanks for all the memories thank you you are listening to the mark martin podcast on the accelerated podcast network Back here on episode 48 of the Mark Martin Podcast. Wrapping things up with Batesville, Arkansas's Larry Shaw. We asked Larry what he's up to now, and he talked a little bit about his battle with cancer. I've had cancer three times. I just got back from Mexico Sunday night late, and we got a place down we go to. Kirk, my youngest son, got cancer too. And uh, we're, we're, we, got, we got good advice this time. So we're in good shape right now. But I've got a cattle farm. I've got me... I, all this stuff I built up, I got a museum at my, I built a shop at my house where I got this, I built a museum behind my house. I got 47 years of racing in that museum. I got like, of course, I got some of Mark, got both of Mark's stuff. Kevin Harvick, I built Kevin Harvick's car running in Bakersfield. He sent the roof to me and 
Bill Elliott, he, I got his, Thornton, I got all kinds of stuff in this. And then I kind of mess with some classic cars and stuff and some real estate and some rental stuff. So, yeah, I'm still busy. I, I just, uh, I didn't ever really want to necessarily sell the race car business. But, man, I was going through cancer and chemo, and I just, I just really was down and didn't really, really, really feel like doing nothing. And the right people come along and offered me a fair price for it. So that's what I did. I don't remember who it was we listened to one time. They talked about uh, it was probably one of the famous race for NASCAR men that want to know how he's going to go out. And he said, I'll tell you what, I want to just be running wide open down the back straight at Daytona and just blow up. That's how I want to go out. But <laughs> we're, we, we hadn't been doing that. We're still surviving. Thank you for subscribing and listening to the Mark Martin Podcast. Remember to give us a five-star rating in your app store. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Mark Martin POD. The Mark Martin Podcast is a production of the Accelerated Podcast Network.